Welcome to Freedom Church, where we exist to reach people to know God locally, globally, and everywhere in between. Thank you for joining us online. We're so excited that you're with us today. If you want to know more about Freedom Church, you can go down to the description below, click the link to our website, and you'll find who we are, what we believe, our different ministries, upcoming events, and things like that. You're joining us during our series called Loving My Neighbor. Our lead and founding pastor, Terrell Somerville, is taking us through this series, um, teaching us how to be the hands and feet of Jesus by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. We hope that you enjoy this series, and if you want to take any next steps, make sure to hang out to the end of the video. The best is yet to come. Freedom Church, how's everybody doing? Let's give God praise for the day, all right? Well, thank you for being here, especially if you're here for your first time. Thank you for coming out. We are so thankful that you are here. And the thing about it is, no matter where we're at on the spiritual spectrum of life, I think we all want to be blessed by our Creator. And if you're searching for your Creator, we're hoping pray, you'll have an opportunity to find him today because he's a loving, merciful God. Let's give God praise for the great worship. We appreciate our worship team. So last week, I started a new series. And when I say series, what that means is it's a series of messages that ties together about uh, correlating subjects and things like that from God's word. But we started last week talking about loving my neighbor. And we know that God, through Jesus Christ, Jesus said the greatest two commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So I hope and pray you're loving yourself well, and you're going to love your neighbor well. So that's what we started talking about. And last week, we talked about reconciling racism, and I've heard a lot of great comments about that. I want to thank you for your encouragement. And also, I want you to know that these are subjects that a lot of times that there's churches and people don't want to tackle, but we want to do it from God's perspective. So last week, when I talked about racism, if you have not, uh, if you are not here, you're here for your first time or you weren't here last week, be sure to go to our YouTube channel or our website or our app and be able to to check that out, be able to go through that message. But bottom line to it is when it comes to racism, it's not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. And so we addressed that last week. Today, I want to move forward and I want to talk about embracing orphans. You say, what do you mean embracing orphans? A lot of times, just because a woman gets pregnant does not necessarily mean that She's ready to be a mom. Lots of unfortunate circumstances is happening today, and we know that. There are women that are bound down in addiction. They are in an abusive situation. They are being mistreated. And they don't yet know even really how to show love. Today, there are kids, birthing kids, And there are those who are suffering with mental illnesses, and the list goes on and on. And that's why some are not even properly equipped yet to be a caregiver of a child. And even guys go out, and a guy goes out, he gets a girl pregnant, he isn't ready to even be a responsible dad. Those are the things that we're seeing today. I don't know if you know this, but according to the estimates, there is an excess of 443,000 kids that are in the foster care system in the United States. There's more than 123,000 of them that are waiting and available for adoption. Now, these children across America understand they are without families. 
I don't know if you know about our own state here, but in the state of Tennessee, as current numbers last week, uh, it was in excess of around 8,890 kids in Tennessee that are in the foster care system. Now, here's what I know. There are far more Christians in the state of Tennessee than there are kids who need a safe home. There are far more churches in the state of Tennessee than what there are that kids need a family to call their own and they can be loved by. There's about 11,090 churches in Tennessee. Imagine with me if the churches that could just took care of one foster child. I believe God is going to stir some hearts today. I believe he's going to do that because the church is God's plan A for every child that's in need of a loving family. Look what the Bible tells us here in James chapter 1 and verse 27. It says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, what is the purest form of religion that God accepts? Is to do what? What does that say there? Say it with me. Caring for orphans and widows. Now, say it from your heart. Caring for orphans and widows. Now, what do we do also in that? In what way are we going to care for them? Look at the next words there. It says, in their what? What's that word? In their what? Their distress. And also refusing to let the world corrupt you. See, love and caring those for children, when we do that, I want you to understand that is the central theme theme of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Putting God's word into practice is so close to the heart of Almighty God. And you know what? I could stand up here and I could show you all kinds of pictures of kids. I could show you their pictures and I could tell you stories. And I want you to know something. Every child that we're talking about, If I said that and I did that to you, you'd say, how can I help? How can I help? They're not a number. And they're not just a stat. They have a name. They have a face. And they have a story. Story of a broken family they came from. Story of they've never known their father. A story of how they were a victim of divorce. A story of how that they experienced poverty. A story of being hurt in domestic abuse. A story of being part of substance abuse. A story of being incarcerated. A story of having homelessness affect their lives. A story of gang violence. A story of going through racism. A story of teenage pregnancy. A story of human trafficking. You say, well, is that even real around here? Just last week in Sumner County Jail, three men in the jail for human trafficking right here. Who pays the highest price for all of these problems that I'm sharing with you today? The children do. And you know what? They can't do anything about it. So God's plan A is for the church to do what? Look in Psalm 82, verse 3 and 4. It says, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So I would say if all of us see someone that's in trouble or we see someone who's in need, we have the heart to help, right? I mean, we help in all kinds of causes. I remember growing up in my father and mother's home. I remember my father coming home one day and he had two groundhogs about this long. He had seen the mother get hit on the road and the mother is di- has died on the road and the two little bitty groundhogs is right there with the mom. So what does my dad do? He rises to the occasion and he gets those two little groundhogs and brings them home. 
Well, what do we do? I was just a little boy and we start nursing them with this little bitty glass bottle. One of the groundhogs didn't make it, but one of them did. And he became one of my best friends. Okay. And then, so that's what we do. When we see a need, we do it. And then, you know, I had that groundhog, he'd run in the house. And how many of you remember the saltine crackers that they would make them in big squares like this? Remember that? Well, what I would do is smear peanut butter on it, and I would take, and I would let him in the door with the rest of the dog, the groundhog, follow me on this, with the rest of the dog. He'd come, jump up in a chair, and he'd perch right up there, and he'd eat that peanut butter and cracker. I'll never forget that. I wished I had another groundhog. He was so cool. But then we tried, you know, the, the soft heart for a skunk, and that, I ain't even going to tell you that story. That didn't go so well, okay? It, it didn't. I'm just being honest with you, okay? But anyway, with that being said... We can be even guilted into saving animals. Save the groundhog. Try to save the skunk. Save the whales. Save the dogs. Those of you that save cats. But my point is this. What are we doing as God's church to save the children? What are we doing? We're not, you think about this and for a moment. God cares so much about these children, more than you and I could ever imagine in our finite minds. And now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned, that the church prayed for since 1973, what's going to happen? It's high time that the church rise to the occasion and embrace the children that need love, that need a home, that need a family, and someone to call their own. Are you with me, church? I'll clap, I'll clap for that if you're not going to. Because it's the truth. We just don't, so many times we just don't think about in our comfortable Christianity. Oh, that's about comfort, right? That's, that's where we're living at. And you think about it, in Tennessee's trigger law, grab this. Tennessee's trigger law took effect in August of 2022, last fall. Okay? And, and it was banning abortion in the state of Tennessee. So what's going to happen when a pregnancy takes place? Have you thought about it? That what we prayed for as a church? What's going to happen when the pregnancy takes place? They're not able to mother the child for whatever reason. There are safe haven laws, and Tennessee is one of the states in our union in the U.S. that has safe haven laws. You say, what do you mean? A safe haven law is where that if a baby is born, they can drop the baby off at a hospital, a fire hall, or wherever at those places without fear of anything happening to them, of the unwanted baby. But then my daughter India tells me about Something that I thought, wow, this is amazing. It's called a safe haven baby box. You say, what's a safe haven baby box? It's a state-of-the-art device that legally permits a mother in crisis to safely and securely and anonymously surrender her unwanted newborn. Here's a picture. Check this out. Here's the first one. They bring us up. These are in the side of, of, of fire halls and hospitals, okay? They can actually open the box right here because they want their baby. That, that way they have dignity about doing this instead of dropping it on a doorstep. Now watch the next picture here. They open up the box and they place the baby in the box. And then the next picture shows where they, that the baby's in there, okay? So well, what's going to happen to the baby when the baby gets in there? See, the installation in this box occurs on the outside of those places that has 24-7 people there. And get this, if a parent opens that box and places an infant in the medical bassinet in an oxygenated, climate-controlled atmosphere, and when the door is closed, the door locks, then a silent alarm sounds. To an, and it goes to a 911 dispatch, and within five minutes or less, the baby is there, responders are there, they open the door from the inside of the building, and therefore, they're able to help that child and get it medical professional help. There is, there's 132 of these active baby boxes in the United States, according to Safe Haven Baby Boxes, and they're in 11 states, and their goal is to get them in 50 states. Here's what you may not know. The 16th one was put in Kentucky in Bowling Green back in December of this past year. In the first week of February, a baby was surrendered into that box, and that baby is doing well. In Knoxville, Tennessee, is the first place at a fire hall in Knoxville, Tennessee, is the first place in Tennessee that's been able to receive and have one to be installed. Well, you know what I believe about praying? 
I believe we as church, we need to look at the things that's going on to help people. So I'm humbled and I'm honored to be able to share with you, Freedom Church, that Freedom Church is in works with Safe Haven Baby Box too, and in work with the city of Gallatin and number one fire hall to install a Safe Haven Baby Box right here in our city. So keep praying that that works out. They're all for it. We'll just, you know, it's a, it's a contract between Safe Haven Baby Box and, and our city, and they're taking care of that. And, but yet there's a cost to it. It's around $15,000. And because of your continued generosity in Freedom Church, Freedom Church can just about cover that cost. And, and we can do that. We can cover the cost within our budget to be able to do that. But maybe you're here and saying, man, I want to be a direct giver of that. If you want to do that, you just hear market and put safe haven baby box and you'll be a direct giver to it. But thank you, Freedom Church, that we're able to do things like this in this endeavor. Look at Psalm 68 and verse 5 and 6. It says, Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God. Whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. So who is God? God is the father to the fatherless. He's the defender of widows. God's dwelling is absolutely holy. So what does God do? God places families, lonely in families. That's what God does. How does God place the lonely in families? families. Well, I'll tell you exactly what he does. He does it through people that are servants. So I'd like for you to make Tiffany Kelly with Tennessee Kids Belong. Welcome to the stage. You guys give her a hand. She's going to share some things with us. Good morning. All right. Thank you, Tiffany, for coming. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we have, uh, my wife and my daughter got me in touch with Tiffany here, and also our own Mandy Bannister here works for Child Services. So I want you guys to give them both a hand again for what they're doing to help children. So thanks for coming. And so can you just give us an overview of Tennessee Kids Belong, Tiffany? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, So Tennessee Kids Belong um, exists to equip leaders in our community, government, business, faith leaders to enhance the experience and the outcomes for kids in, co- in foster care. And we do that with three strategic methods by one, family recruitment. So a child, having a family for every child, a sense of belonging. Um, two, through community engagement, like churches, businesses, um, and then being a coalition for change, providing hope to our communities by rallying around the needs and bringing them to the community. So when we think about what you're doing and how you're doing, how many kids are currently in the foster system far as Sumner County proper? Sure. So Sumner County right now, I think I mentioned to you, is around 128. Previously, we're actually around 140 right now. Um, And of that number... Let me make a point. 20 more since we had this conversation last week. Yes. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So 140 in the county, and we only have 80 foster homes. Um, so that kind of tells you where our needs are. Um, we're wow. needing our kids look a little different um, nowadays with pandemic, with society, um, with trauma. And so these kids are kids that are teenagers, sibling groups of four or five with really higher level of care that's needed and, and trauma experiences. And so um, a lot of these kids need families that are equipped and skillful in really loving through some of the hard days. So what kind of ways, let's, let's be honest, not everybody here will be called to foster or called to adopt, sure. but it's much more than that. Mm-hmm. There's so much more that everybody here can get involved in some ways with their time or their treasure or whatever. Can, so can you expound on that and let our church family know there's other ways that everybody can get involved? Absolutely. So one of the things that Tennessee Kids Belong is um, doing is we're bringing the yes to everyone um, and engaging in foster care in some way. And so that can look like um, becoming a foster parent um, or it can be loving a foster parent. If you know a foster family, it might be wrapping around them with words of encouragement, respite or what we call relief care. 
um, acts of service, like bringing a meal, being a laundry fairy, um, coming over and shooting hoops with a teenage boy in the yard so mom can do a little bit of self-care herself, Um, and then prayer. And so prayer is one of those things that um, we really emphasize. Um, The work that foster families do, it's a spiritual battle. The enemy is out to, to really destroy families. And so when a family says yes to serving a kid from hard places, um, we really encourage that wraparound piece. Um, it's one of those things where um, you can be 10 or 80 and really, really serve a family. Um, I always tell the story. I, um, my executive director was speaking at a church and an older gentleman came up to her afterwards and said, wow, foster care is great. I can't be a foster parent, and I'm definitely too old to adopt. Um, But she said, well, what do you do well? And he said, I can make a a darn good batch of blueberry muffins. And and at that moment, she said, well, could you bring a batch of blueberry muffins to a foster mom every time she got a new placement? And he said, well, yeah. So right there, his skills, his talents, they're being used for kingdom work. And that foster mom, she gets a little alone time with a kiddo over blueberry muffins, doesn't have to be in the kitchen slaving away, but she can really pour into a child that comes into her home and needs that attention, that time to really connect and build a healthy attachment and relationship. And then we also engage our businesses. Um, So as a business leader, um, Cheerville next door, Cake Joy in the area, um, all of them are doing something as far as a, a discount on their goods and services. Um, kid, our families go sometimes from two kids at the breakfast table to six. And Ooh, so awesome. activities, extracurriculars, all those things, um, they're a lot and expenses add up. And so when our business community can say yes to them, our families can continue to say yes to the need. Um, so those are other ways that you can get involved. Um, and again, it's one of those things where I tell everybody, if you have a skill or service and it may look a little weird or it doesn't really necessarily know how to fit in foster care, come find me and I can make it happen. That'd be awesome. And another way, of course, you know, people that they get later in life, they're empty nesters or for doing fine financially, there's support to be able to help people to adopt because it can be expensive because all the legal fees that goes into that. Absolutely. Right now in the state of Tennessee, you have 400 kids eligible and available for adoption. Those kids don't have an identified placement for permanency. And so when families say yes to them, there's extensive needs and support services um, that are required. And now there are some services that are out there and resources, but the financial support um, to allow a family to continue to say yes and even work through some of the things that happen even after adoption are really vital. Well, what we want to do, we're all about next steps here. So in the back of your seats, church, we have a card here. And number one, if just everybody can pray, everybody can pray. Please say that you're going to pray. But also on here, it says your name, phone number, and email. Uh, It just basically tells, uh, if you're already a current foster kinship or adoptive parent here, please let us know that so we can support you. Also, if you'd like information just mark it on here that you like information about being a foster, foster parent. Also, what she mentioned about being a rap team, that is words of encouragement, that is being respite care, helping with that, acts of service and prayer and all that. Say, I would like to be involved in that to some level. And also, if you want to get your business involved or offer a discount to a foster family, please mark this card. Everybody can do something. So please get it out of the back of the seat. Mark that. Drop it in the offering when you get done. And Tiffany and Mandy have a table set up out here. If you would like to see them, they're going to be hanging around after the service. Please, if God's pricking your heart, go and talk to them. They can answer questions in particular and for your particular setting. So would you guys give Tiffany a hand? We appreciate her so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. So, next steps. I hope and pray you're thinking about that because I believe there are kids right now that's praying for a home. And God is looking for families that will say yes. What if God had your home and your family in mind? What if you were the answer 
to a child's prayer? What if you were the one that that child could say, he's, they're praying, give me a family, Lord. Give me someone to love. Lord, give me a place to be able to belong. Some of you are thinking, well, I know, pastor, I'm supposed to love and I'm supposed to care, but I'm not called to foster. Or I, I'm not called to adopt. And maybe you're not right now. Maybe your life is so busy right now and you're running in, at breakneck speed. You need to do a better job, honestly, at home with your own family. And that's okay. You know, I'm, I'll let you off the hook on that. But for others of you, before you ever say no about what we're talking about, pray, pray, pray. Seek God and say, God, would you have me to be involved? And to what level would you have me to be involved? I can do something. Listen, is there something that God wants us to do? Be praying that because... God may be calling you to be a blessing to someone who's in need before you say, no, I challenge you, please, please pray. Here at Freedom Church, we've been praying and, and we've been doing different things and, and even there's a family here in our church that need that is fostering right now. Would you guys attune your eyes and check out the video of Danny and Sean Rhodes? I'm Danny. And I'm Sean Rhodes, and we've been fostering for uh, almost 15 months now. What led you guys into fostering? A slow restaurant, a Ukrainian girl, teenager, and uh, I got set right in front of her, and um, everybody else is talking, and there's this young teenage girl that doesn't speak English, and, and we really hit it off, and... Um, after we were done, I told Sean, I said, I don't think I'm through being a dad yet. And I was surprised because I always wanted to be a foster mom. But um, after um, my divorce from my ex-husband and everything, I didn't think it was ever going to happen. So I just kind of let it go. So then when he brought it up, I was like, are you for real? <laughs> this is crazy. But so let's pray. We got our families praying and we, we prayed for a good couple months before. What are some moments of frustration with fostering? Boyfriends. <laughs> Not liking their choices sometimes. Yeah. I think sometimes it can be kind of frustrating too to feel a little bit alone in the process because not many people understand. Um, they go, oh, they can relate as a parent, but foster parenting is a little bit different because you're not raising your own kids, you're raising someone else's broken child that they broke. What have been the greatest fruits and celebrations? There's one girl who she aged out and um, I was a little hard on her and I was worried that, uh, I was worried about it anyway. She come back and was like, uh, you guys did a really good job and you know, I really appreciate you and I want to see you and everything. So I think it's been really good too to watch the process, even though it can be very frustrating to go through uh, and watch these kids you fall in love with go through the healing process and it's so heartbreaking sometimes to hear some of their stories but to watch them actually grow um, and mature and start learning to trust and start learning we're, we're still working on forgiving sometimes but um, start learning to just be kids um, I think that that part's pretty cool <laughs> Um, what do you wish people knew about fostering or adopting that people might not know? <clears throat> I would say it's not an easy process. It's, it's definitely like being on a roller coaster, ups and downs, curves being thrown your way. And not every kid is going to be a, a good fit. So we don't get much of a say in anything. Um, and we're finding that out right now, actually going through some things that, you know, they live with us, we see the ins and outs, but when you go to court or anything, we don't get a, we don't have a say in, in what they're being brought up or at school, their parents still have rights, and so they get to have the decision-making process and all that, and so that can get kind of hard and frustrating sometimes. What would you say to others um, considering fostering? Pray, <laughs> a lot. Um, I think that that's, uh, I'm glad that we did. We didn't go into it without God's blessings. We definitely feel like it was a calling on our lives. Definitely do research, pray a lot. <laughs> Personally, as a foster parent through this journey, what has God taught you or changed in you? He's really been showing me how to just rely on Him 
like for everything you know before you just kind of go through your days and through your motions and now you're going okay lord here we go again this is going to be another roller coaster or here you know how do we handle this or and you just go into him more and more and more which is what he wants right and with danny um i think we've grown closer through the whole process because where else do you go no one really understands it like we do so we kind of have to rely on each other you know what's been amazing about danny and sean is getting to see the kids come here and I've been blessed so much that they want to come up and say hi. And it's been such an encouragement to me here at church. God's church is plan A. When different people say, I'll do my part to rescue the needy and to care for the children, that's what's so important when you rise to the occasion. And let me say this to you, and I want to encourage you and tell you this. You may never be more like God than when you do. So let's do what we can. Together, we make up a lot of people. And I want you to think about that and think about it hard and pray about it very hard. Be sure you fill this out. Be sure you do this. Everybody can do something. Because here's the thing about it. When it comes to God, I was adopted into God's family. I was a spiritual orphan. Many of you are Christ followers. You knew what it was like to be a spiritual orphan. I was separated from God by sin. And that's what brings in the family of Almighty God. What did God do? Because Jesus came and paid the price for my sins and for all of humanity. When we call on the name of the Lord, we get to be spiritually born into the family of God. And when we do that and we think about the blessing of having God's blessing on our lives, man, how can we think no other than being a blessing, especially when it comes to kids? And I love what it says in Ephesians 25, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Think about God the Father, it brought him great pleasure and if it gave God great pleasure imagine what it'll do for us when we help the kids right here in our back door some of you thinking man I could just never foster pastor I could never do that because I wouldn't want I would get my heart broke listen the goal is not for you to have them the goal is to get them back to a healthy biological family and it's been said one time, it's said this, if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. If it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. When did serving God ever become our convenience and our comfort? When? I don't read that anywhere now, I'm not wanting to guilt anyone into this at all but I want everyone here to recognize that we can step up and there's two promises I want to tell you it's not going to be easy there's going to be tears there's going to be difficulties there's going to be heartaches and it's probably going to be one of the hardest things you'll ever do but the time and the resources and the effort for that child is worth it let me say it again the time the effort and the resources for those children are worth it it's worth it it's worth it come on somebody it's worth it is it worth it church it will be worth it And I know everyone can adopt and foster, but everyone can do something. Church, we believe in the sanctity of life. We care about all life. We deeply care and value the unborn child. We deeply care about that baby. We deeply care about a teenage girl who ends up pregnant and she's scared to death to be able to help her instead of condemning her. 
We care about brokenhearted adults, and you may be one here, and you have lost your parental rights. Our hearts go out to you. Listen, people just don't need a family. People need God's family to step up like never before, and we can be that amazing spiritual family and help people out. So they know the church is not a place to run from, but a church is a place to run to. So what do we do? We pray, we put legs on our prayers and we do something. You know what? Think about this. Investing in a life of a child won't change the world. But investing in that child's life, I promise you, will change their world. Just imagine, what if our church here, we had a waiting list to serve in Freedom Kids because we have kids over there. There's times the foster kids are over there. What if we had a waiting list? We had to say, wait, you can't serve this month. There's so many people wanting to serve over there. What if every single mom and every single dad had knew in their heart and mind that they had the support of their church family? What if there was a, a lady that had that untimely pregnancy and they were so glad the church cared enough for them and loved them through that to help support them or to find a loving home for their baby? What if instead of children waiting for a family to love them, that we had families waiting for a child to be able to bring them into your home? I believe that if our church would rise to the occasion, this could be, we can't do everything. We can all do something. Would you stand with me as we pray?